at the core of it, we don't understand anything. Our very physical sciences, our Newtonian physics, clearly is just missing a piece of the equation. Something that it just has not factored in yet that's underpinning the whole thing. So is there something out there? Clearly there is. Do we have any inkling what it is or have we ever? Probably not. Can we even know? I, I don't know. I mean, we're limited by um, primate brains. And even though we have a very advanced and highly evolved primate brain, that is a physical construct within a physical seeming setting. And so there are going to be things that we may never be able to grasp as long as we are in that physical construct. And I'll tell you something else that the old folks always said, that the shamans and the witches and the people of power learned it from the Bigfoot. And if you look at the um, accounts of the witch trials of the Middle Ages, well, they said exactly the same thing, even to the point that you've always got this story about how they went out in the woods and they worshipped the devil. Well, read those descriptions of the devil. It's not a red man with horns and a tail. It's a big, hairy giant. So, yes, of course, they were going out in the woods and learning stuff from these people, our shamans and people of power and witches and whatever else you want words you want to use for these people who saw a little bit more and maybe were using a little bit more of their brain than everybody else you know they, they always said they learned it from them all the myths say that these abilities came from the gods and were learned from these other beings This is Bigfoot Crossroads. I am Matt, and joining me is a gentleman that I've been wanting to talk to for a while. He, he reached out to me a long time ago uh, through the website and sent me one of the most intriguing emails I have ever received. And a lot of the reason behind that uh, was specifically most people, uh, as we were just talking about before we started, think in terms of binary thought uh, it's either this or that and I feel like I have lived a life very grounded in logic and science but then also having this other side to me where I'm experiencing paranormal things growing up and witnessing things that I have no scientific explanation for and it just being part of my life and having to navigate both of those worlds. And now on this podcast, I kind of do the same thing. Uh, I have people who are quote unquote woo. They uh, believe Bigfoot is something supernatural or they talk about their own uh, paranormal or supernatural experiences. And then I also have very scientific grounded uh researchers who only deal in terms of what we know and logic and what we can prove. And that can be a difficult place to be sometimes, but I feel like it isn't a case of this or that. I think it can be this and that at the same time. And my guest on this episode, uh, I believe, <laughs> uh, thinks in those terms as well. I I'd like to welcome Steve, uh, Steve, thanks for joining me. And if you don't mind, uh, you know, if you can give us a little bit of your background and your story and what led you into this Bigfoot world and sending me that email. Well, thank you for having me. First of all, um, I almost don't even know where to start. <laughs> um, I grew up in the Appalachians. And so I grew up in um, sort of an isolated community, sort of in the woods, not, not way up in the Appalachians. We're actually down in the foothills um, just before you get up into the Appalachians. And um, 
So I grew up with my uh, life sort of my feet, one foot in each world, one foot in the world of, of what my family and ancestors and people thought, and then one foot in the world of science. And I've always been very drawn to both mythology and science since I was a very young child. Um, one of my very earliest memories is of my parents going to a drive-in theater, and they took me with them. It was for a double feature late at night. I guess they thought I was going to sleep through it in the back of the car, and I didn't. And um, one of the movies they saw was something to do with Bigfoot. I don't know what it was. Um, I've asked my mom repeatedly, and she doesn't know what movies they saw. She does remember the incident, though, because um, during one of the movies, I started crying, and they couldn't get me under control, and they had to leave. And, of course, that was the movie. And I was about two years old at that time. And I remember it. I know I know it was, uh, was it about two, two and a half, because my brother was born when I was three, and my mother was not not close to term at the time we saw this this movie. Um, so it's been a, an awareness. I saw a UFO when I was three, the first one I ever saw. So there's always been this, um, you know, awareness of the other. But then I've also been extremely drawn to science and knowledge. I taught myself to read when I was three, four. I, I had some help from my mom, but basically once she taught me letters, I went crazy with the encyclopedias that we had and you know, I was off to the races from that point on, and I've never quit. Um, so I have always had my feet in both worlds. My um, family had people in it who were, um, of course, you know, they all went to church, and so they weren't like pagan or anything like that. But they maintained some of their old world beliefs, like old world world fairy beliefs. And, um, you know, up in the Appalachians in the old days, uh, their doctors were like root doctors and healers and often went by the term witch or uh, wizard or, you know, these kind of terminologies that we maybe have a different view of now than they had then in those days. So it was not uncommon to hear these fairy stories, and uh, it was not uncommon to um, hear all this mythological content. And of course, they were aware of these beings, whatever they are. They were aware of all of this stuff, and so that was integrated into their stories and their beliefs. And so from the get-go, I have been exposed to it. That would be a lot to try and process as a child absorbing all that stuff and then having to deal with the rest of the world where, you know, the, the common belief system is, well, that's all a bunch of fooey. Uh, <laughs> none of yeah. that stuff is real. Well, we were very, um, it was very impressed on us that you don't talk about this other stuff to people. You know, if you know any Appalachian people, you know they're tight-lipped and they don't trust outsiders. Yeah. And so this was stuff that – and it's not like they were sitting down and like, oh, come here. We're going to teach you the family history. This stuff was just being picked up a piecemeal. So, you know, at a family reunion, all the great aunts were sitting around whispering about something. And since I liked hanging out with the old people, I didn't hang out with the children. I didn't like the children. I wasn't like the other children. And so – my um, great aunts and my grandmother and, and, and you know, th that generation um, recognized in me, you know, th things about me that, that um, others might not would have seen. And so they let me be around them and they let me overhear them talking about the adult stuff. And so I picked up all of this just piecemeal. A lot of times I would even ask one or the other of them, or maybe when we got home and asked my grandmother, well, what did, you know, what did this one mean by that? And you don't need to know, yeah. <laughs> you know? So it wasn't a matter of like, you know, me being apprenticed or sat down and taught, but because I was around them and because as my grandmother said, she saw in me that I had, abilities. Um, she um, said that I used to be able, uh, that she noticed as a little kid, I'd break branches off trees and stick them in the ground, they'd grow. And so to her, that was a sign that I had what in the family is considered this group of abilities that the healers and those kind of people would typically have. And so it, it was paid attention to, and all the great aunts saw it. My interest in those things 
they saw. And so they would give me a little more information. I mean, like my brother to this day swears that none of this could have possibly happened because he was out playing with, you know, toys and never heard any of this. He was never told any of this. Um, So I, I was just picking this up at the feet of those older relatives. But the one thing they always stressed is you never talk about it. So how do you go from there to devoting your life to science? Oh, because I want you to know the real answers. I didn't believe their stories as, as from the time I was a look at, I mean, because I mean, I, I, I didn't grow up like it was a little house on the prairie. I grew up watching the Brady Bunch and, <laughs> you know, Gilligan's Island and all of these things. And so I knew there was this other world out there. And as I was reading the encyclopedia at three or four or five years old, I was running into science. I mean, science had put a man on the moon before I was born. I was born in 1969. So, you know, I knew that science was where it was at. And then my grandmother and my other family members encouraged me to pursue it. They saw no conflict in it. You know, they knew this was where the knowledge for the future was. That's interesting. That's interesting because that that is kind of where uh, my train of thought happens is that I don't see these conflicts that other people see between these two worlds. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, science, you know, is just basically uh, a word that we apply to our ability to understand things based on the constraints of our own abilities of observation and understanding and reasoning. Yeah, that's exactly right. And words are really poor vessels to convey understanding. Words don't convey understanding. Words convey meaning, and meaning is variable. So I can say a word, and I mean one thing by it. You hear that word. You hear what you think that word means. Right. I mean, and to come down to it, words are just us as animals grunting and, and hissing and moaning and assigning meaning to it. Words don't mean anything. Words are nothing. They don't exist. It's our belief in the word that makes the word a thing. You know, I say all the time, words are not things. Words are the shadow of things. So let's take a word that you already said. (laughs) Uh, Mm -hmm. UFO, that conveys uh, an image in people's heads. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. tell me about that UFO sighting when you were a small child. Well, um, we were going to town. My mom and my grandma are in the front seat of my mom's little um, uh, Volkswagen Beetle. And my brother and I was about four. My brother was about a year old, um, are in the back seat. And we're going over the first little hill as you get out of the holler. Um, You go down a hill and then up another hill and then you come out on the main road. We were going down that hill. And my brother and I are both turned around the back seat looking out the back window for some unknown reason, and from east to west, a low-flying silver disc flies across the road, right behind the car, right over it, um, with red, green, and blue lights going around it. And I remember feeling, um, now, of course, as a little child, I was scared of everything. (laughs) Everything freaked me out. People, people, I was terrified of people, more terrified of people than I was of of the, the... odd things. But um, so it it freaked me out, but I don't remember having terror from it, just kind of this feeling of that, that that this was something, Mm -hmm. you know, and um, it flew from east to west. And, you know, we went right on to town. I didn't say anything about it. I don't know why I was silent about it. My brother, of course, is too young. He doesn't remember it. Um, But a few days after that, I told my grandmother about it. And she was just like, well, you know, they're, they're around sometimes, you know, and of course to her, you know, some of the fairy folk, I don't think anything of it. it's good folk, let alone, you know. Now, the interesting thing is where it flew over. Um, I knew from the time I was very young was where I was going to build my house. And I'm sitting in the house right now that I built that is the exact path it flew over. Wow. <laughs> Whatever that means. I don't have an answer for that, but, but, um, but that is a that is a fact. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be a, a tough conversation for me. I'm just going to be perfectly honest because there there's so much uh, so much stuff, man. <laughs> like, yeah, I yeah. mean, uh, the part of the country that you're talking about, 
I mean, so much weird phenomenon that happens there. Oh, yeah. And like you're saying to the people uh, who are, are rooted in the community, this is just part of life. Mm -hmm. These things are just happen there and they're just accepted, even though they're not necessarily talked about because they don't want to be, you know, made fun of or whatever. And just ridiculed. Right. Exactly. And it's interesting, your grandmother's reaction to that. I remember the first conversation. I was raised by my great grandparents and they were both originally from, you know, the mountains of Arkansas and eventually left there and moved to Oklahoma and that's the you know beginning of the story of my life and uh i remember talking to my my granny at a very early age trying to ask her what the deal with the ghosts were the the ghosts they were they were scaring me right i was having these encounters i you know on almost a nightly basis you know and I, and i asked her and like her reaction was just a reaction of complete acknowledgement that yes, they're there mm -hmm. and she, but her faith and her belief system was those are just guardian angels. There's nothing to be afraid. Right. Of. Right. They're just there looking over you. Don't worry about it. You know, exactly. And just go on with and your I life. Had a very, <laughs> very similar experience, very similar conversation in my grandparents' house, which I, my house is not, is my house just below the hill from that house. It's still sitting up there. Um, there, I would see a, a spirit or a ghost or a shade, whatever you want to call it. We call them shades. Mm -hmm. um, that was my grandfather's grandmother. Of course, I didn't know who she was. She had died in that house, and I would tell my grandmother about the old woman. She was like, "Oh, that's that's Grandma Polly. Don't don't pay any mind to her." Yeah, she she died here, you know. And then there was a spirit in the house because uh, when I was born, my parents lived in the city, one city down from the one we, we you know, the, the family farm is is by. And um, there was there was a darker spirit in that house. It was the old man who had owned the house before them who had died there. And I didn't like him. He was scary. Yeah. Um, and I would try to tell my parents, of course, they didn't believe any of this. You know, my um, my parents always thought their parents were crazy, <laughs> you know, and they didn't I mean, because, you know, that generation, they're the they're the baby boomers and all they wanted was a color TV and a big car. Yeah. You know, they, they didn't want to hear about any of this old mountain stuff. You know, quit with your old superstitions. Don't tell them children that those old lies, you know, and so they didn't want to hear any of this. And I'm sure it was very confounding to them when I popped out and started seeing spirits and telling these tales and stuff sounding just like their parents. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the story is that these uh, these abilities skip generations, which that's you know that's just recessive genes when I look at it. I mean, how much of this stuff, you know, the the mystical stuff, do you attribute to just things that we just don't really understand yet scientifically? A hundred percent. I was going to say, do you think there's Anything out there? I, I mean, I, it's such a hard concept to even grasp, but the idea that there are things that defy all explanations, even beyond our own comprehensions or whatever, there's actually something truly mystical out there, or is it just stuff that we don't have the right sensory organs or we don't have the right tools of measurement to understand it at this point? Both. It's a hundred percent both. And you're going to get that answer to a lot of questions tonight. <laughs> it's a hundred percent both. We don't understand anything. See, that's, this is the thing at the core of it. We don't understand anything. Now we know how some things work, but do we understand it? understanding and being able, I don't know how a combustion engine works, but I can drive a car. Yeah. You know, I don't, I could not build a computer. I don't really know how a computer works, but I, I use them all the time. So it's kind of like that. Our, our, um, our very physical sciences, our Newtonian physics clearly is just missing a piece of the equation. 
Mm-hmm. There's something that it just has not factored in yet, which I suspect is consciousness, um, that's underpinning the whole thing. So is there something out there? Uh, clearly there is. Do we have any inkling what it is, or have we ever? Probably not. Can we even know? I I don't know. I mean, we're limited by um, primate brains. And even though we have a very advanced and highly evolved primate brain, that is a physical construct within a physical seeming setting. And so there are going to be things that we may never be able to grasp as long as we are in that physical construct. And that's the first place my brain always goes to the things that we're probably never going to understand. Right. And honestly, I I love that. Um, I love the very Orwellian phrase, certainty through uncertainty. Yeah. The one thing I am certain of is that I am uncertain about it all. (laughs) Just like the one constant is change. Yeah. That that will kind of lead right into this one. You have mentioned to me that you have seen uh, orange colored orbs or just orbs in general several times. Yeah. Orbs yeah. is something that has captured my fascination just over the past year uh, and has moved kind of up to the top of the list. I mean, like Bigfoot still has my heart, ghosts still up there, you know, alien stuff, uh, UFO phenomenon, all that. But orbs. Now, I think they're central to the whole thing. I mean, these things have been seen forever. Forever. And I would say that they're the origin of all of our religions. Um, And I would even say that they were one of the major triggers for our massive advances in consciousness in the sense that if you give some uh, if you give a being mystery, if you give something a mystery to pursue, that's going to strike the sparks that fire off the evolution of, of brain activity. Well, and real quickly, I will say that I, I have come around to the the possibility that they are a plasma intelligence oh, you know okay. that's the basis of of gregory little's research on them but anyhow um i saw them as a child um i saw them periodically throughout childhood now when things really went peak for me uh, i had uh, gone to college i was living in gainesville florida and then when i moved back here to build my house um, that was in 1991. I had read Communion, just, you know, Whitley Strieber's Communion, just yeah. before I moved back here. And then once I got back here, um, they just all snowballed. And I went through the year that it took me to build this house. Um, I went through a year where every night I would go outside and I would see these and I would have experiences with them. And so it was a whole year of experiences to the extent that other people saw them with me, which I'm so grateful for that there have been times when other people have seen this with me. Um, but yeah, that year it was just crazy. Um, every night I would go outside and uh, three of those orange orbs would come in. One would come from the uh, west, one would come from the northeast, one would come from the southeast. They would come in around me in a triangular form, and they would first start, they would be out at a distance, they would look like stars, and then they would move in closer, and then they would start moving around in a circle, keeping their formation, and they would come in closer, and what they would end up doing is being a little triangle up above me, circling up above my head, you know, 100, 200 feet up in the air. I did that every night, and occasionally it got a little crazier, and of course it was making me crazy that year. Um, You know, I'm like 20, 21, 22 at the time, and, you know, I just read communion. I was certain I was about to be abducted any minute. never happened as far as I know, Um, and I've I've had um, regression to try to remember it, and there's nothing there that I can get to come up. There's some stuff out of childhood, but there's nothing you know, at that time, I don't know what they were doing. I believe it was connected to building this house to tell you the truth. Um, so I don't know what that, any of that means, but by, um, August of that year, after the house was completed, I've been living in the house about three years. Um, I decided to go back to Florida and do some more work. And I was there for three more years. And at the, um, about a month before I left here to go back to Florida, um, 
I was just getting to the point where I was losing so much sleep and I just felt like I was going crazy and it was all driving me crazy and I was having all this fear and panic and um, I was at my back door and there was one of them hovering up in the north and I just looked at him and I said, please, you've got to stop. You've just got to go away. I can't do this anymore. And they quit. Uh, <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Sorry. It, it's just, I mean, that's, I think that's the part that gets me about it. Oh, they're totally interactive. They were interacting. They're, this is a consciousness that's interacting. This is not swamp gas. This is not um, alien tech, quote unquote. These yeah. things aren't aliens a bit more than I am. This is, this is an earth phenomena. Uh, they go throughout our history. They're on our cave paintings, you know? Yeah. This, is, this is an earth phenomena. Now, that doesn't mean that they're in the same dimension we're in, but that doesn't mean they're not on the same planet, you know? I mean, and I, I'm using conventional words that we all use. Yes, um, yes. But when I say dimensional, I don't mean it in some woo or new age sense. I mean it in the same sense that, you know, Rosenberg or, or Einstein would have meant dimensions, other levels of reality. The part that keeps on coming up over and over again whenever I talk to different people uh, who have witnessed these things with the interaction, I mean, you know, intelligence behind their behavior. It's not just a, a, a ball of lightning, like you're saying, or swamp gas. It's right. Right. And even when I moved back from Florida after those three years, which was in 94, I have had a few sightings, but very few, they kind of stay away. And almost to the point that I almost regret telling them to go away. Um, because it's like, they seem to have taken that more seriously than maybe I meant it, <laughs> you know? Um, and especially as I have gotten older and I'm so much less fearful of all the phenomena, you know, I, I would not be opposed to more interaction with them now. Uh, but they seem to have really taken that to heart. I've seen them very little, though I have had three or four really intense experiences since then. But let me tell you, back to that year, back to the 1990-1991 year when I was building the house, um, some, of the, some of the peak experiences. My uncle's house is just uh, right over from my parents' house. I was living in my parents' house while we were building this house. And I would go out in the field in between his house and our house. And one night I was out in that field, and there's a spring behind his house. And I saw a huge ball of fire come up out of the spring, go up above the trees, and turn into a solid, what looked like a solid structured craft. Out of the spring? Out of the spring. Came up out of the ground, out of the spring. And, of course, you know, now to me, immediately, fair folk, because my ancestors always associate fair folk and water spirits with springs. Springs are holy places. And, I mean, my ancestors would have just been 100%. You've gotten the attention of, of the good neighbors, you know, because they would have never said the word fairies. You know, that's, that's verboten. You don't, you don't speak their name. <laughs> you know, you use nicknames for the whole phenomena. So, like, they'd say boogers instead of, you know, calling them trolls or whatever else. What did the structure look like? Well, just like a disc-shaped craft, you know, just... Uh, just your classic UFO. Classic, 100% classic. I've only seen two kinds of, maybe two, maybe three kinds of structured craft myself. I've seen those discs, and I've seen what I call a reconnaissance ship that's like a little, like a mushroom cap on its side with like lights and exhaust on the back. And, and when I've seen them in dreams and been up closer to them in dreams, there's a little door there on the back, and I know what they look like on the inside. You go in, and there's two little chairs in there. Now, I don't, I don't know what any that is. And the thing of it is, when you look into like what Gregory Little is talking about or what Paul Devereaux is talking about, and even what there is a um, – if you read either of those books, they talk about the report that came out on UAP from um, the British some years back where they're saying that you know this is a plasma phenomena and it can make – it makes humans hallucinate. In other words, it, makes, it can make humans see whatever they want to see or what they want you to see. So I don't know that any of this is real, but that's what I've seen. Mm-hmm. So what I'm describing to you is what I've seen, and we'll leave it up to the listeners to decide if it's real or not, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the two kinds of crafts that I've seen. All of that uh, 
train of thought is uh, really interesting, and it's something that uh, certain private entities and government entities have been working on and trying to understand and figure out the ability of basically matter manipulation and changing solids into non-solids and back and forth and right. using sound right. and all sorts of things. Uh, plasma is also something that has recently come up in some Bigfoot documentaries. Uh, yeah. Which mm -hmm. I find interesting. And obviously there's a lot of people out there who have seen orbs. We're just going to use the term orbs for the sake sure. of people understanding what we're talking about, uh, who have witnessed orbs while Bigfooting or associating them with Bigfoot. And you have mentioned something about some possible overlaps yourself. Could you talk about that a little bit? Oh, a hundred percent. Before I do though, let me, there's one other sighting that happened that year. That was one of my favorite uh, that I'll tell you about real quick. And then we'll, we'll skip on over to that. Um, there was a friend visiting me, and the house was framed in, but it, it was dried in, but it wasn't uh, livable yet. The inside was being finished, and we came down here, and we got up on top of the roof, and we were sitting on the roof um, just talking. It was late at night, probably close to midnight, and all of a sudden, a light appears on the southern horizon that is as bigger, bigger than the moon. Just this massive light just out of nowhere, poof. I mean, like a round circle. It's not, it's not like the orbs. It's not like a thing on fire. It's just a big, round, glowing, white, glowing circle. And out of it, all of a sudden, start coming all those little orbs. Dozens and dozens of them came out, and they're all flying around. And, and I'm like, to my friend, I'm like, do you, do you see this? Are you seeing this? He's, yeah, I'm definitely seeing what you're seeing. And um, so the little orbs, they're all circling around for a while, and we're just sitting there watching. And then all of a sudden, all the little orbs just go back to the big one, and they merge into it, and then it goes out, and it's gone. Poof. <laughs> I mean, what do you even make of something like that? I mean, I've actually seen a video very yeah, similar to that. Like that. And I've, uh -huh. I've read some uh, accounts, uh, I think one was in the 60s, the 50s or 60s, where uh, someone saw something very similar. And I've seen that type of thing one more time later with another friend in like about 97. Um, although, though the little lights didn't come out of it, just something as big as the moon flashed in the sky and was there long enough for me and him to both see it and then was gone. That's one of the things that happened that's happened after I moved back. But um, yeah, but I mean, you know. Now, I mean, again, I could speak in the language of my ancestors and tell you exactly. I mean, they would have said they know what that is. You know, that would have been the fairy host. That would have been the, the wild hunt. Yeah. You know, great. I mean, it's great, but that doesn't give me any answers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that gives me a mythological overlay for it, uh, which is fine. I love the mythological overlay. I, I don't resent the mythological overlay. I just don't believe it. But isn't it interesting that you have all these different uh, communities of people, all these different... I, I mean, just civilization, just different societies all over the world, different uh, belief systems, everything, uh, religions, all the different things where there's so many things that are talked about and just different names applied to them, but they're all talking about the same thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. How can you not see that as acknowledgement that these things do exist and are very real? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, humans are fear-based, and I find the more um, committed a given person is to their belief system, the more willing they are to shut out parts of observable reality. So on the religious end, people are going to, you know, immediately go to demon, mm -hmm. no matter what it is. And then on the science end, they're going to go to, oh, that can't be real because it doesn't fit our Newtonian physics. Both of those are fear responses, in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they, they are desperately clinging to their certainty in a given story, and they don't want anything that's going to interfere with that story, you know. They're looking for confirmation biases. They're not looking for mysteries outside of their, their ballywick. Right. But yeah, these things are everywhere. They're constant. 
Um, they've always been going on. They're always described. You can go to any culture on earth and you're going to find these stories. And that's like with, with my ancestors, they didn't see any of this as evil. They didn't see this good either. It was neutral, but they tended to view everything as neutral until proven otherwise. So there, there wasn't any judgment on it. There wasn't any, you know, for, for my ancestors, uh, there wasn't any judgment on experiencing or seeing any of this. And maybe you'd go to the fair folk if you had need, you know. Uh, and when I say fair folk, I'm not just talking about UFO, alien, UAP, whatever, Bigfoot, Dogman, all of it. That's all fair. That's all the fairy world to to that to, the, to that mythological cycle. Right. You know, like what what we call Dogman, they call Puka. That's that's what Dogman is in the fairy lore. You know, we want to say werewolf. Well, there are no werewolf in fairy lore. You know, not until much much later in the middle Middle Ages. But in true the true old fairy lore, like the Irish in, in the southwest of Ireland, we're still practicing up into the last century. Um, there weren't any werewolves. There were Puka. Puka was the water dog, and Puka would trick you, you know? You say, you've got to watch for the Puka. <laughs> and so it's all accounted for in there, and like um, Bigfoot, they're, they're, they're the trolls, you know? They're the um, various, you know, giant types. The uh, even, even the different kinds of aliens are accounted for in the fairy lore, so it's all there. Before we went off on that subject, I want, I want to get back to those overlaps that you talked about. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, the overlaps is just that there's always been Bigfoot stuff going on. The little creek that runs in front of my house, there was a story from when I was a kid that someone saw a Bigfoot or, you know, what they call a big monster walking through that creek. Well, of course they did. You know, we're here in the foothills where the Appalachians come down to the foothills and then run down into the to, into the bluegrass and then down into the lake country. So, of course, they're passing through here. You know, you can look to this day on Google Maps and you can see the vast forest of the Appalachians and right down to where we are is about where they end. And then I'm surrounded by the Dan Boone National Forest. I mean, that's classically a hot spot for Bigfoot activity. Oh, yeah. And Dogman and the whole nine yeah. yards. Yeah. Well, for instance, on the BFRO website, when you look at the county I live in, there's two reports. They're both within a mile of my house. Oh, wow. Yeah. So. Do you think there's a connection between the different phenomenons or are they just separately occurring in the same geographic locations? Well, I have a, I have a lot of different thoughts about that. I don't have one that I'm, that I'm sold on. But let's say that the one is aliens and the other is a cryptid hominid or a cryptid Ponjet of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't they be just as interested in them as they're interested in us, the aliens? You know? So there's one. They might even be more interested because really the, the Bigfoot people are way more interesting and astounding than we are. The fact that they've survived us when none of our other hominid relatives have yeah. really speaks volumes about what they are. Um, but then here's another consideration. What if there was an ancient, ancient being on this planet that came to consciousness and had civilizations before our ancestors even came up out of the tunnels, you know, when we were still rodents, you know, what if, what if a hundred million years ago, there was a dinosaur that became conscious, you know, what if 50 million years ago, there was some kind of mammal that became conscious, you know, we act like we're so special that no, nothing's ever done it before. We either have the religious interpretation, that, oh, we were made this way, or we have the scientific interpretation of, oh, there's no consciousness like us. And that all just sounds like people patting themselves on the back to me. I don't think we're that grand in the big scheme of things. I don't think we're the worst thing that ever existed either, but I just, all human myth puts us on center stage. We're the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I don't, I don't buy it. So let's say that there was an ancient being that evolved millions of years ago and still here, hiding out from us, because who wouldn't? And um, then the Bigfoot is a different advanced hominid, you know, a different consciously advanced hominid, wouldn't that being be interested in them? If they're both hiding from us, wouldn't they maybe make alliance? That's the way the fairy folk explain it, is that all these different races that fall under the banner of the fair folk um, are all different races that are 
sort of all just in loose alliances. It's not that they're all like great pals or that they're all palling around with each other. You know, so maybe it's something like that. Maybe there's two different things here, you know, three, four, five different things here. And in order to survive us, they cooperate. You know, but then here's another possibility. What if it is all the same phenomena? What if it's this plasma, this conscious plasma that's always been here on the planet, it's always been conscious, probably long before us, and takes on whatever form it wants to interact with us however it wants to? So I don't know. I mean, those are just three possibilities, and there could be endless others. And what if we call that plasma God? Exactly, exactly. Because absolutely, to, the, to my ancestors, the, the fair folk were gods. I mean, just know two ways. The rulers of the fair folk were gods, the high ones, the Trois de Donin. Talking about that, you know, this alliance, all of that type phenomenon, just, you know, just for the sake of conversation. Something that kind of interests me is a concept of whenever you look at Bigfoot in the physical description, the, you know, uh, this big hairy primate uh, master of its domain, master of staying hidden there. It seems to fit more in line with this planet than we do. I agree a hundred percent. We're the anomaly. Right. Absolutely. What if we're the alien invader and, and we just don't know it. And, you know, we were put here long ago and, and I mean, because that's how, that's how, that's how we would react to aliens, isn't it? I mean, wouldn't we do the same thing? A hundred percent. Um, I've, I've read Sitchin, Von Daniken and all that sort of thing. I was really obsessed with the AAT when I was younger. Um, I, I don't really believe it now. Uh, but certainly I don't discount it I, out of hand. Um, certainly that could have absolutely happened. Um, some other intelligence could have come here and tinkered with us and made us the way we are. However, when I look at us because of my background in the sciences and the particular sciences I've studied, what I see is a domestic animal. Humans are domestic animals because the biggest feature about us is that we, we are neotenic. You know? A neoteny is when a creature um, looks like the juvenile or the infant form right. of its progenitor. So, um, you know, we look like a baby Bigfoot that's reached sexual maturity without physically maturing. I mean, because think about the descriptions. I mean, you know, I've been obsessed with Bigfoot my whole life. So once I got the Internet in 94, I was off and running. I've kind of avoided the community because I didn't want to get in all the fights and the squabbles and arguments and all that. But I've, you know, been one of those people lurking on the periphery for, from the beginning. So I've read everything I can get my hands on. Um, so, you know, I've read a lot of accounts and, and listened to a lot of accounts. And, and whenever I hear a description of baby Bigfoot, I'm like, you know, OK, yep, there's. Sounds an awful lot like human. So I think we're a domestic animal, and I don't necessarily believe we were domesticated by something else. We, we, you can domesticate yourself. I think that's kind of what we did. Now, that doesn't discount that there – I think there were other things going on in our past. I don't know what that was. I don't have a set theory, but I just can't buy for a split second that all these other – branches of our tree existed for hundreds of thousands and millions of years longer than we do did or have. And all they did was sit around and twiddled their thumbs and, and hunted. I don't buy that for a split second. That doesn't, the pattern doesn't fit, you know, um, hominids do stuff. It's what we do, you know? And so the notion that all these other hominids did nothing and I'll tell you something else that the old folks always said, that the shamans and the witches and the people of power learned it from the Bigfoot. They learned it from the fairy world. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the um, accounts of the witch trials of the Middle Ages, well, they said exactly the same thing, even to the point that you've always got this story about how they went out in the woods and they worshipped the devil. Well, read those descriptions of the devil. It's not a red man with horns and a tail. It's a big, hairy giant. So, yes, of course, they were going out in the woods and learning stuff from these people, our shamans and 
people of power and witches and whatever else you want, words you want to use for these people who saw a little bit more and maybe were using a little bit more of their brain than everybody else. Um, you know, they, they always said they learned it from them, you know, and that's, that's uh, consistent throughout human history. All the myths say that the abilities came from the gods and were learned from these other beings. I think I've gotten off on a dirt road and I was going to say, <laughs> no, but, no, no, no. Um, I was just thinking that's an interesting concept and it's uh, fascinating to me that as humans, our brains have always operated under the pretense that if you insert the term God, gods, whatever, it's always talking about something coming from somewhere else beyond here. And we don't necessarily know that that's true. Right. Right. You know, even the Greek gods up on Mount Olympus, you know, were separated from everyone else. Yeah, sometimes it's up on high mountains that we can't reach. Sometimes it's from below the sea. Right. You know, to the Celts, it was Manawan, you know, the god Manawan, who was the god of the sea and lived under the, uh, under the you know, the Irish Sea. Um, sometimes, you know, the Neptune, Poseidon. So, so it's these different places that we can't access. You know, but look at the fact that the Tibetans carry a gene from the Denisovans that allows them to live in high altitudes that other humans don't carry. And and that's all in the grand scheme of things. That understanding and revelation is fairly new. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, there are a lot of things that I have thought for a long time that the last ten years have seen borne out. And I'm talking about in in our human evolutionary history. I've said for years that humans were hybrids. That we were clearly hybrids. Um, and you know, I would get laughed out of the room if I brought that up twenty or thirty years ago. And since time, I'm I'm the one laughing now. It'll turn out there were at least six variations of of hominid in our ancestry. We know four or five at the moment. So let's kind of shift gears into that area. Sure. After we've talked about all this crazy woo stuff, uh, Mm -hmm. you are a scientist. Yeah. With a background in science. I mean, we won't get into specific details, uh, but, you know, the hybridization stuff... uh, fascinates me and yeah absolutely you know you had sent me uh some of your manuscript and like i said i looked over it It, it's a lot it's a lot one of the things that kind of stands out whenever it comes to hybrids is a lot of people believe that hybrids that's the end of it you can't reproduce you know right but that's not necessarily true generally speaking it's not true at all even to the extent that they, uh, the Spanish had breeding lines of mules. <laughs> now, everyone thinks that mule, you know, a mule is the ultimate sterile hybrid, can never produce an offspring. Small percentage of them can. And in Spain, they had found, uh, you know, someone by chance had run across, um, you know, a, a fertile example of a male and a female, and it started breeding them. They had breeding lines of mules that were bred specifically as riding animals for nobility. Huh. So even the classic example isn't true. I'm just going to throw it out there because it's the most popular question on all Bigfoot podcasts. What is Bigfoot? Do you think Bigfoot could be a type of hybrid? Yes. I would. It, absolutely. We're hybrids. Um, I think all hominids have always been hybrids. And let me step back just one second away from the specific and give you something a little more general. Here's what hybridization is. Hybridization is Mother Nature's way of helping to avoid extinction. And what that means is that hybrids almost always occur in times of stress and extremis. They occur in times of geological upheaval and climactic change. That is the most common time when hybrids occur. Now, there are ranges of overlap of different species or even sometimes genus where they will have hybridization ranges. But in general, it usually happens in collapsing ecosystems or in times of of change. And so it is an escape valve from extinction. 
What that means, what I mean by that is that um, as long as a male of this snake and a female of that snake find each other, if they're the only ones left, they can mate and produce offspring. And so there will be snakes. There won't be the male species and there won't be the female species anymore. There'll be a new thing, but they will still be snakes. And so that's kind of what hybridization allows. And then the other thing to consider with hybridization is that there are only four types, there are only four DNA bases on this planet. Every living thing on this planet is made up of those four bases. We're all the same thing. So what makes it where some things can't interbreed is their evolutionary distance from each other. In other words, specialization. No, we haven't existed long enough to have specialized that far. You know, hominid, uh, hom the hominids, the hominidae, arose beginning about 6 million years ago, between 6 and 2.6 million years ago, and then after 2.6 million years ago is when the hominins arise, you know, and that's just not enough time to have raced, uh, erased our ability to interbreed. Um, I don't know, but what we wouldn't still be fertile with chimpanzees. I don't think we should find out. I'm not recommending it, but I would suspect we still would be. I, I don't know that we could interbreed with orangutan. You know, they're 10 million years or so separated from us. That's a long time. But 2 million, nah, that's, that's still going to work. Um, 6 million, you know, we're separated from chimps by about 6 million. 6 million, maybe. Um, so the reason I give you that preface is because if Sasquatch is what I think it is, then it's just one of the variations of the interbreeding hybrid hominin tree that went a different direction than we went. My guess would be that they split from us about 2 million years ago. I do not believe they belong to the homo genus. I believe that they, and here's the thing, when you're talking about hybrids, Hybrids, unless you've got a rare situation where the hybrid occurred and then it never went back to one of the progenitor species and became its own new thing, what tends to happen is the hybrid goes back to one side or the other more easily. Right. And so most hybrids tend to go back to the side they can go back to. And so what you end up with is, say, a population of black rat snakes that carry a little bit of corn snake genetics, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. Um, what I think then, oh, we're a perfect example. We are predominantly homo sapiens, but we've got a little bit of these other homo, gene, uh, homo species within us that we're still carrying. But our mitochondrial DNA for the whole species is um, homo sapiens. And then that mirrors like domestic chickens you know their main mt dna is the chinese version of the red jungle fowl south chinese version for a jungle fowl gallus gallus but they've got the other three types of jungle fowl blended in them in the nuclear dna so what i see here is that we have a, a fundamental split early on in the hominid tree where you have the australopithecines they're the first thing then are uh, the australopithecines split into two major trunks. One remains more Australopith and becomes things like um, Paranthropus, and then the other side becomes Homo, uh, becomes homo and they become um, Homo habilis and then Homo erectus and, you know, right on down the line. And um, so I think that the predominant genetics of most of these Sasquatch type beings, we would be looking at Australopithecine, probably Paranthropus. And the reason I say that is because I'm trained to do comparative anatomy. Mm -hmm. And when you do comparative anatomy of the existing known fossils from our lineage, the one they compare most favorably to in terms of bone length ratios is the the Australopithecines and the Paranthropus. 
So I think the bulk of their genetics is paranthropus. The bulk of our genetics is homo, but all along the way we've interbred. So I think we carry some of their genes. I think that's going to be one of the other things. Because, you know, even right now, we say that people, sub-Saharan Africans, don't carry Neanderthal genes, except now we know they do carry a tiny bit from a way earlier breeding that was carried back into Africa before our ancestors even left Africa. But there's also at least two cryptic populations that are in um, sub-Saharan African genetics that are not any of the known forms. So what are they, you know? And since we don't have, or, or at least we don't have in the scientific world acknowledged uh, Sasquatch DNA, we don't have that to compare it to and say, oh, yeah, there's, there's you know, 0.06% of that in modern humans. And then I would think that in their lineages, they're carrying some of our genetics. But, you know, when you've got these big, tangled, interbreeding um, bushes like we we come out of, um, and you've got a spe uh, you've got a, a group groups of genuses that are um, generalists and that are fairly nomadic, you know that will travel, you know have feet will travel. Um, we get around, and I suspect we've been getting around for a good three million years, you know, and so everywhere a population migrated into and ran into a different group. You either had, um, you know, rape or marriage, you know, I mean, because our recent is history shows that, you know, a lot of us white folk didn't get our uh, Native American ancestry through nice practices. No, not at all. No. So it's, that's just, that's human. That's just human. It's what humans do. And so wherever they have met up, they have interbred for whatever reason. And certainly in the upheaval of the younger Dryas would be a time period that's, you know, 12, 13,000 years ago, um, a time period when there was so much ecological havoc going on for a thousand years. I think that was probably a time period when there was a lot of inbreeding. But then when you look at our Holocene history as a species, Homo sapiens as a self-domesticated or not, but as a domestic hominid creating civilizations, I think what you're looking at there is a process of intentional forgetting, of self-segregation. Remember, domestic animals will sometimes not interbreed with their wild um, progenitors easily or willingly. Right. Um, and a, a, a separation. I think that the biggest bulk of separation from us with all of our other related cousins has been in the last 15, 20,000 years. And, and the genetics bear that out. Um, now, of course, part of that is just that some of the others are allegedly gone. Are they at least gone enough that there are so few of them, they're not showing up in the archaeological record? You know, so like by 12,000 years ago, Denisovan are gone. The Neanderthals have been gone for 10,000 years or more at that time. So obviously we're not interbreeding anymore with a species that's pretty much gone. Or even if there are little surviving pockets, they are live in such a cryptid manner that we're not interacting like that anymore. But I think that when we started civilizing and creating and, and moving from tribe to urban settings is when we really start to not only segregate ourselves physically, but mentally from our past and mentally and physically from everything that's going on around us. We become extremely insular because then we have something to protect other than hunting grounds. We have fields and homes and cities and, you know, we have this infrastructure that, that, kind of excludes us. But that doesn't mean everyone was doing it because, you know, even now not all humans live in urban settings. You said something that was kind of interesting to me that I hadn't really thought about before. Uh, so let's say that this theory is correct and Bigfoot is this uh, distant relative uh, that survived. Is it possible that there are others as well that might explain 
some people's beliefs that there are different types of Bigfoot? Oh, yeah. And then even more than just that there are other types, uh, when you've got hybrids, they can go all over the map. So let's say that uh, this group over here hybridized, and that group over there hybridized, and this group down here hybridized, and then each are in isolation. They're not exchanging genes for whatever environmental and or sexual selection type reasons. This group selects itself one way. That, that group selects itself a different way. This group over here selects itself this way. And so they end up looking different, even though they're all the same kind of hybrids. In other words, um, one of the genes that we as Homo sapiens take from Neanderthal is hair texture and skin color. You know, that's, those have both caused more than their fair share of trouble in our history. <laughs> Very much <laughs> and, so, yeah. And they also have caused people carrying one type of gene to see the people carrying the other type of gene as evil, less than, bad, this, that, or the other. When we're all just, you know, I mean, every Homo sapiens living on this planet is so gen genetically alike. We're all practically clones. Yeah. We've gone through some tremendous bottlenecks that are unusual. One of the only animals living on the planet that is as bottlenecked as us are the cheetahs. Any given troop of 20 chimpanzees out in the forests in Gambia have more genetic diversities uh, genetic diversity than all 8 billion of us. Wow. Let's take Bigfoot. Uh, I mean, how large of a population would it require? Uh, that's another thing. It wouldn't require a very big population because what's clear from the extent of our bottlenecks is there are times when the Homo sapiens have fallen down to as few as 1,000 individuals. Yeah. About 70,000 uh, 70, years ago uh, when Penatubo blew um, and created that's that's what actually probably drove our ancestors out of Africa is the fallout from from that time period. We bottlenecked and almost went extinct. And there's you know there couldn't have been more than a few thousand left at that time in in Africa in that in the in Eastern Africa. Now there were there were the there were the others you know there were Neanderthals and Denisovans and they were further north and so they wouldn't have been as affected, but um, even they they go into decline at that time. So different people have different theories on this one. My own personal belief is that the idea of Bigfoot uh, migrating around North America is just not a logical one. It doesn't make sense to me. I think they may have um, seasonal territories, but I, but that's not migration. Right, right. I, I do. I agree I, with you. I don't I, think they migrate. I definitely agree with that, especially in. Uh, I mean, obviously, the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. idea of them going up and down in elevation throughout you know different times of the year and everything right. for sure. Right. That's what they do here. Yeah. But for the most part, you know, if, if it seems as though if they have everything they need in a territory, they stay put, they stay put. So I would think interbreeding would occur mm -hmm. within those groups. So is that That's right. something that can happen and sustain a population? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It will eventually drive them to extinction. You know, they're now thinking that's what happened to the Neanderthal. They tended to stay in small family groups that interbred deeply, and the fewer there were of them, the more they inbred, and that may have been part of their what brought them to extinction. It will eventually cause so many deleterious genes to surface in the population. I mean, and I'm from Appalachia, so, you know, I've seen it. I've paying close personal um you know you inbreed enough you get problems right. however you know we hear about the kind of things we hear about the ones that look down syndrome we hear about the ones that look um you know they have, only have three toes we hear about all these weird things that go on you know um my dad's side you know it's awful to say my people are appalachian there's a there's a quantity of inbreeding there my dad's side of the family um the men all have uh, like a toe deformity really yeah, I have a mild version of it. So, I mean, these things happen. Oh, like the blue fugits of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, 
example of inbreeding. And then when you get something weird enough that you you and your family are the only ones that can stand to look at it, um, that then only promotes deeper inbreeding. Um, so basically, I, the roundabout way, what I think all this is, is that you have um, – the way I would phrase this is you have populations of hybrid origin that have become regional variations. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Well, that's what, that's what our species did. That's what we became. Right. That's what our quote-unquote races are. Yeah, and so, it, so I think it's the same with them. But with that said, I also think there's more than one thing. I don't think it's all just one big happy family. I think there's probably like the Alma, for instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Almas, I think they are probably closer to Erectus or Neanderthal. Something different than the North American Bigfoot, the Pacific Northwest Sasquatch. Whatever I, you want to I call. think the Almas is, yeah, yeah. And then when you look at things like the, uh, uh, is it called Igu Bobo? I can't remember how that's pronounced. It's the African, the little people. The little people are something different, you know. And we have stories of the little people, of course, too, you know, my family. Um, I've never seen any of those that I know of, but I've certainly heard stories about them. Um, And the little ones that just look like humans, um, to me, are probably just little cryptic humans, uh, not necessarily homo sapiens, but some kind of homo genus. The little hairy ones are probably, you know, because there were gracile forms of australopithecines, too. I mean, when you look at the um, uh, what they now call Homo floresiensis, um, they're now thinking that may be a small australopith, a gracile australopith, rather than a gracile erectus. Certainly, something that could have existed in other locations besides. Absolutely. Oh yeah, we get around. We get around. <laughs> our 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 brand, our tree has always been on the move. Yeah. Ever since the droughts drove them out of Africa, began driving them out of Africa, you know, two and a half million years ago, uh, we've been on the go. And I mean that for the entire ball of wax, the the Australopiths and the the Homo genuses, both have been mobile. So something that I've always wondered about not being uh, completely well versed in the field of uh, genetic sequencing you know, DNA testing and uh, genetic sequencing is becoming more and more advanced with time. We're getting a better understanding on how to go about it. But you've heard numerous stories over the year of, you know, samples being submitted, being tested, and, uh, sorry, human contamination. Right. Is it possible that it's not contamination based on what you're saying with your theory? Uh, very likely. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've read Melba's paper, certainly, because um, that was immediately of interest to me. And I think she did really good work. She did a couple of things that, that you know, didn't affect the work, but made the science world look at her as crazy. You know, talk of angel DNA is what sank that. But when you look at the actual, just the sequencing, it's it's done well. My understanding is the work was solid. The problem was the interpretation. Yeah, absolutely. But now, even to some extent, the interpretation is correct because that male side has some gene sequences that are not known. But what does that mean? You know, there again, if you're a person of of faith in a particular faith, to answer an unknown, you will have the tendency to go to your faith. If she had been Hindu, she would have called that maybe Diva DNA or Krishna DNA, Uh you know. Um, She called it angel DNA. Well, okay. I mean, that's coming from her interpretation. That's fine, but that ain't science. And she should have known that was going to get her laughed out of the room. And it pushes a certain... Uh, agenda, <laughs> agenda, and belief system that I just recently spoke about. You know the the theory that yeah, these are absolutely. nephilim or nephilim offspring. Uh, right, right. There's a lot of people that believe that now. Yeah, which I, I don't know how because you know I know the Bible real well. I've read it extensively. I grew up in Baptist churches, just like everybody else in the South, Baptist and Pentecostal. And um, I've actually taken the time to read that book. I don't didn't just sit there and listen to the preacher. 
And um, I don't know how anyone can read that. And then, of course, I've gone to the actual Hebrew, and I've spoken to Hebrew scholars about what they think it means. No one who I don't I don't know how you read that text and you get Bigfoot out of what they're describing as Nephilim. I mean, I would say the the thing with Esau may be a little closer to a description of Bigfoot. The Esau story reminds me a great deal of the Gilgamesh story. Mm-hmm. I think those are coming from the same well of ancient knowledge or ancient belief or what have you. Um, you know, with uh, in Kidu in the Gilgamesh story as the hairy wild man. Um, Esau, to me, looks very much like an Enkidu stand-in um, because Jacob is very much like a Gilgamesh figure, so you're dealing with a myth theme there. And you also have the story of Beowulf. Absolutely. I always thought that kind of sounded like a Bigfoot in certain uh, renditions of the story. Absolutely. Oh, 100 percent. I agree. And they're all over the place. You know, you get those stories all over the place. I mean, even, you know, Japan even has its own versions of hairy wild men. I mean, they're everywhere. But on the one hand, you know, we can look at that and say, well, the the wild man is a um, archetype and maybe there's something in us like genetic memory where we you know, can can dream that up. I mean, I'm not convinced that anything is real, you know, on, on the one hand. I mean, what if all of this is, what if we're plasma beings having a fever dream that we're material, you know? <laughs> I mean, for me, I'm not going to say, well, you know, that's just myths and it can't be real um, or that it is absolutely real and it couldn't be them just imagining it. Again, I'm going to fall back to my default position. It could be both. They're describing a real thing, and they're having some kind of ancestral memory uh, that has persisted in myth and legend. And so, and basically, I think that's what all the stories are. I think you've got some truth with some mythos wrapped on it. Again, not this or that, but this and that. But both. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You know, but I, I suspect that there are, I mean, here's the thing. Three million years is a long time. A lot can happen. And so every little branch that got isolated could have become its own thing if it was isolated long enough. And if you have it isolated long enough and then say it's isolated for a million years and then it runs into a different form later and interbreeds once, that may not change it very much. Especially if if the hybrid, the F1 hybrid, is bred directly back into the progenitor. You know, so that's the thing. I mean, this is all so complicated. Hybrid, hybridization is complicated. That's why scientists in the 20th century really disliked the concept of hybrid. They wanted everything cut and dry. You know, they wanted this became this became this, and never the twain shall meet, and none of it can interbreed. Well, but it's kind of looking quite different. And so that makes things really complicated, and it makes it gray. Well, we don't get to use those those little boxes anymore. We can't put this here and this here. And, I mean, your description of hybridization uh, is, you know, Mother Nature's way of pushing survival. I mean, to me, that translates to we don't have time for evolution. We got to change right now, and this is how we do it. That's right. That's right. And of course, it also is called punctuated evolution. Hybridization is part of punctuated evolution. So it is it's one of the modes of evolution. And then you mix in the evolution that takes place in environmental adaptive Uh uh, situations. Mm -hmm. You know, you take situations like uh, Australia and the Galapagos Islands where, you know, the two most famous places for adaptive evolution uh, but that can also exist in a hidden pocket on a mountain in the Pacific Northwest. Or a, a mountain up in the Appalachians. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those those blue fugits, I always go back to them. They're one of my favorite examples. You know, if someone came up to you and said, there's blue people up that mountain. <laughs> <laughs> ain't no you, way. Oh, oh, <laughs> you're right. I ain't no such thing as that. Yeah. Yeah, you would not believe that the blue fugits existed if you didn't see them. I mean, if someone had written in a diary in 1490 about blue people, 
that would be dismissed resoundingly by everyone, but yet they exist. So that's the thing. Things can get weird. Uh, th that's just the thing with reality, with evolution, with there's nothing cut and dry. The whole thing's real, real super plastic. And what I mean by plasticity in the term of genetics is that things can change on a dime if they need to. And the new genetic knowledge that we're gaining from epigenetics throws that even further off the deep end because – Epigenetics is basically an almost immediate response to the environment, and it's not even changing the DNA. That's changing the RNA that modifies the DNA when it translates it into proteins. So that's a different mode of evolution. Just like a reaction to something, basically? Yes, which tells me that it's all conscious the reason I always go back to consciousness, and I hate to say that because it sounds so woo and it sounds so new age, but it's what Einstein thought. It's what Bohm thought. It's what, you know, all the great physicists of the early 20th century thought that consciousness was the base of the whole thing. And it appears to me, now, of course, my strict materialist friends get really distraught when I say this. Because they're like, DNA is not conscious, RNA is not conscious. I think it is. I think that it is, RNA has one goal, and that is to survive. Remember, RNA appears before DNA. RNA is the first life form on the planet. In my opinion, it's still the only life form on the planet. RNA is driving the whole ship, the captain. And so it's the RNAs that translate the DNA and turn it into proteins. And what I mean by translate it is they modify it. They make it work the way it works. So like if I have a gene that removes melanin from my skin, you know, that same gene might do something different in a different genetic background where the RNAs are translating it differently. Huh. Yeah. So just when you think that you've got genetics figured out, hello, epigenetics. Yeah. And so that's a whole other ball of wax, you know, and I observed this for years in my research and I kept telling some of my colleagues, um, there's something going on here, non-Mendelian. Oh, there can't be. It's all Mendelian. I kept saying there is something going on here. I mean, because the kind of research I was doing, I was working in, in um, immunogenetics was my main area of, of work, which is the study of genetic resistance to disease. And so I kept seeing instances because uh, I was working with huge numbers to get the kind of data that I needed. I was working with huge numbers of individuals. And over that, with working with huge numbers, when you would go in and you would look at all the data, you would always have some things that fell outside of Mendelian norms. You could not put that in either a... Uh, unigenic or um, polygenic framework, you know, just wasn't segregating right. You weren't getting the right kind of numbers. And I would, you know, I would report that, like, well, this has to be thrown out. It doesn't fit. And I was like, but it's still happening. And so over time, um, once we started learning about epigenetics and started learning how to really look at those, what those RNAs were doing, um, they started realizing some of what I had been pointing out was epigenetic function. And there is a big industry that, um, an agricultural industry that used to spend millions of dollars a year, billions of dollars probably on antibiotics that no longer has to do that. And that's because of some of the research that I was part of. Wow. Yeah, so it's just super, super complicated. And when when I look at all of this, and, you know, I'm armed with my background in science, with my cultural background in myth and legend and woo and all of that, and then you combine on it my ability to recognize patterns, I see a pattern in these cryptid hominids. And that pattern is that it's the same pattern I see everywhere else, which is a hybrid population, just like we are. It's just that we went into – we exploited one environment. They exploit a different one, and that explains the differences between us. You know, we self-domesticated. They remain wild. Yeah. It's that simple. Our distant ancestors looked, acted, behaved just like them.
except they weren't as big. And then w- to, to explain their gigantism, um, I'm not, you know, clearly the Australopithecines, clearly the um, Paranthropus were not as big as Bigfoot. They didn't get that big. But what I think happened is when Paranthropus came up out of Africa and got into Europe and Asia and were up there in the Ice Ages dealing with Ice Age megafauna, just like everything else, they became a megafauna because they remained wild. Our ancestors didn't become megafauna because they didn't remain wild. Is it possible that Ice Age ends and now environments change, their environments get smaller? Is it possible that they evolved into something smaller than what they used to be or are in the process of doing that now? I don't know. It's, it, it's always a possibility, but then if those genes for gigantism are so locked into them, there may not be any room for that to change. You know, that's the, that's the thing. I mean, species go extinct when they can't respond to change. Right. You know, we, like the, well, a good in, uh, example of megafauna is that the mammoths in the far north were bigger than their ancestors in Africa. Mm-hmm at the time of the ice ages because the ice ages didn't affect africa you know there was there was africa was not glaciated africa got drier in ice ages that's what happens in in the southern regions during an ice age the north glaciates the south gets dry in interglacials the north deglaciates and the south gets wet you know and so those are driving forces i don't know i mean the thing of it is Environment is always causing the potential for change. And the, the Sasquatch has to be under some kind of environmental pressures now that they weren't under 100, 200, 500,000 years ago. But then again, even with that realizing it, so are we. Right. I mean, yeah, but we're changing. Yeah, absolutely. If they have the genetic diversity to change, then they, they, there will be changes going on. But that's not really something I've thought about, and so I can't speak too well to it. I can only speak in the most general of terms about that. I would say that they are, a, um, they are an Ice Age megafaunal hominid with predominant descent from Paranthropus-type Australopithecines. But then that doesn't exclude them carrying some of everything else. Because one thing that you see over and over and over in the literature is the ability of them to breed and produce offspring with us. And I don't discount those stories. There's too many of them. And it makes sense. It's exactly what, you know, I mean, because you think about the fact that we as Homo sapiens do not carry neanderthal mtdna well there's a whole lot of implications to that that means if the original hybrids happened from a sapiens father and a neanderthal mother that the daughters were sterile and couldn't pass her mtdna but more than likely what it means is that male neanderthals took female sapiens in the days of old and created hybrids that would not have carried Neanderthal mtDNA. Well, had that happen? Was that peaceful? Was that, you know, bride exchange? Could have been. I mean, a group of a troop of sapiens could have come into a Neanderthal area and they could have met peacefully and exchanged women, knowledge, tools, whatever. But just as likely the first sapiens came up out of Africa and a group of Neanderthals uh, killed them and kept some of the women or snuck into the camp and kidnapped some of the women. Does that sound familiar? 